the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Devon. It is vampires. It's a host of damned souls of hell and The true God. When he's dead. He can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Hi everybody, this is Irene Allen Block, the host of the Paranormal UK radio show, the flagship show of the Paranormal UK radio network. Here with me again tonight is, as usual, the one and only Margie Johnson. Hello. (laughs) God knows if people could hear the amount of times I have to do that opening before we get it right. I, one of these days, I'm going to be tempted to leave it in. Well, I know. You're going to do the bloopers, don't you? Yeah, I have to do a blooper reel. Mm. The number of yeah. takes. You, you know, you know, I you could have this all like written out in front of you and you just read it. Well, then it'll be, yeah, but I, you know what it's like. You try to introduce something by reading. It's, hello, I'm Irene Allen, blah, 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 blah. It's all kind of robotic, isn't it? You know, it's not... You can always tell on the television, sweetie, when somebody's reading something. You can tell, because it's the way their voice goes. Sounds like some of our politicians. Yeah, well, that's it. You've only got to watch a politician, and, you know, it's uh, it's all kind of robotic, you know. it's uh, It just doesn't flow. <laughs> anyway, t- talking about flowing, so you had a day off yesterday. Well, yes. Labor Day, so you said. Yes, we had our, what you call a bank holiday. We had Labor Day over here in the U.S., three-day weekend. So what did I do for Labor Day? Did a lot of labor, labor out in my yard. <laughs> yeah. My yeah, wife and I went did, did a lot of weed pulling, dug up some bushes, cleaned some planters, a lot of outdoor work. And now everything looks do, lovely. Do you know something, Mark? Mark? What? You call that a yard. We call that a big off bloody garden over here. Well, it's That's just... like mine. A yard over here is a little square area, usually made down of concrete, just concrete. Well, over here, a yard is just a patch of land in in the back of the house, or the front, or it could be the front yard or backyard. But I don't call it much of a garden because all I have is grass and rocks. Yeah, but those rocks are beautiful. Oh, I was so jealous when I saw the photograph of those rocks. I could really do something with them rocks. But Mark, how big is that area? Uh, it's I sit on a little over an acre. Well, there you go. How can you call it a yard, you twit? It is. Well, like I said, there's no flowers or bushes or anything, so it's hardly a garden, which is what yeah, I think of got, when I hear garden. Grass. You've got grass. You've got trees there down the mountainside. It's absolutely beautiful. It's only a matter of planting a few roses and some flowers, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's the trick is planting them and keeping them alive. Well, you're meant to water them in hot weather, Mark. Yeah. Well, I do that, but I always uh, tease Sherry, be- my wife, because uh, she's never met a plant she couldn't kill. <laughs> well, what you've got to do is you've got to go to the nursery. You've got to tell them what, where you live on top of the mountain, where you live, what the atmosphere is like and all that sort of thing, what would be suitable for that area, and maybe you'll find something that's going to survive. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get around right, to that- it. That's Gardener's World over to over and finished with for today. <laughs> <laughs> what else has been happening? Oh, no, I'd rather talk about gardening than talk about everything else I've been complaining about lately. You know, I'm saying, I, that, that's something I, I'll apologize to our listeners. If I've seemed to be, you know, a bit surly lately or, you know, in a bad mood, it's just that I've allowed what's going on, especially over here in the U.S., to get me more than it should. So I'm now just trying to zen out, realize, you know, can't change anything. 
don't have any power over it, so now don't let it all have any power over me. That's right. That's the way to go. So, and the station? We own the radio network. We own PA UK Radio. Yep. And um, more UK radio network. So what's been going on? You know, what's what's happening in our network, Mark? Well, we've we've uh, picked up some more outlets. I mean, uh, people can hear us on on our streaming service, of course, uh, through our uh, website at paukradio.com. We also stream on Stitcher and um, tune in radio and the paranormal radio apps. But we and also many have many other places as well. But all of our podcasts, the, our listen on demand, has really mm. been expanding. I mean, you can hear us on Spreaker, um, TuneIn Radio, um, Google Podcasts. We just got picked up for. Um, we got on iHeart Radio. We've got on uh, Apple Podcasts. So pretty much anywhere you have a mobile device, you can find us. Podcast Addict. Uh, a lot of different. If there's a podcast app, you could probably find us out there. So yeah, and we're waiting to go on to Amazon. Yeah, um, uh, 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 not Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon, yeah. Amazon podcast, which isn't set up yet, but we're already submitted. Mm. So once they get that one rolling, we'll we'll be on there too. Great, because a lot of. Um uh, people from the, off of the television, they have podcasts on there as well. Yep. You know, television stars. So being on there is a good thing. Yep. We've Plus, been, we've I've been... got Alexa, so I can listen through my Alexa. Yep. Listen right. through your smartphone, tablet, mobile device, or through Alexa. Or, or even... Yeah, or your Google Home. Google Home will do it. Mm. Yeah. Just ask the question, PA UK Radio or Paranormal UK Radio Network. And uh, you'll find us or they'll find us. Yep. These small apps. We, we've added a couple of shows. We're going to be adding a couple of more. Our newest show is uh, Nick Hayes with his UFO Chronicles podcast. Mm-hmm. And um, we got a couple more that we're talking to. So, you know, again, we're just the network continues to grow. Yeah. It's getting big. Yeah, yeah. It's the biggest. It's the biggest in this part of the world, anyway. You know, in in the UK. Yes. Let's face it, and of course, streaming all across France, Germany, all over Europe, as well as Australia, Canada, and America, and everywhere. So, you know, we are big. We are getting very big. I was looking. The, uh, uh, this girl's going to have to get some bigger knickers. <laughs> I was actually uh, looking at uh, some of our listener stats the other day, and right now, I mean, I'm even looking at it right now. We're in Greece and India, Poland. Those countries are all currently tuned in. What about North Korea? Is he in? No, I haven't I haven't seen Kim Jong-un. Well, well, you know, now they're saying he's dead again, so oh. uh, I haven't seen him tune in in a while. But, you know, if he starts, if, the, if we see another North Korean one, maybe his sister is tuning in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. Russia. Russia loves us. Yep. Yep. We yeah, do good in Russia, too. Yeah, they want to know what I'm writing in the book. What? Oh, yes. Well, you got to get that book written. Well, yeah. But they keep on tuning in because for the simple reason, all they want to know is what the secrets are. And don't forget, the psychic spy is their handbook now. <laughs> it is. Yep. And I've learned how to uh, perform on ordinary living room chairs. Oh, there you go. Well, you know, that chair scene was uh, <laughs> something that all of them were tuning in for. Yes, yes that's true. And that's if you don't know what true. we're talking about, read the book. Go and get the psychic spy. Yeah. But I tell you what, hopefully the second one. Operation Paris is going to be a lot better. Well, you have to finish writing it before people can uh, can read nearly it. Nearly there, Mark. I am nearly there. Well, you know, you but... know, I just got to blow, blow up a few more Russians and uh, assassinate a couple of Chechen terrorists, and I'm there. Okay, cool. I'm done. All right. Well, we're waiting. Can't yeah. wait to see it. But you're going to have to see it because <laughs> you've got to proof it. <laughs> I got to edit it for you. 
<laughs> uh, so uh, speaking of books, why don't we go ahead and introduce our uh, guest for tonight? Mm-hmm. Go then. So uh, our guest for this evening is an author, a uh, musician, an artist, and he has uh, a book that just came out, I believe it was just came out this year, uh, called Shine On, The Remarkable Story of How I Fell Under a Speeding Train, Journey to the Afterlife, and the Astonishing Proof I Brought Back With Me. Uh, so we want to welcome David Ditchfield to the program. How are you tonight, David? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Good to meet you both. <laughs> Hello, David. <laughs> you know, David, I was telling Mark that a friend of my father's who used to work on the railway, do you, do you know Clapham Common? Yeah. Yeah, there's a big gap at Clapham Common between the platform and when the train pulls in. Mind the gap, they say. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. On a bend, I guess. That's right. He fell yeah. down in it. He, oh, he literally man. fell down the gap as the train was yeah. pulling out, and his yeah. head was smashed to pieces. He survived. Uh, no. He survived. Crazy. The scarring oh. and the operations that he went through, so I know exactly how you must be feeling or how you felt or what happened yes. to you. It must have been absolutely traumatic. It was, yeah. Um well, what happened to me was um, something very similar. I was, I was seeing a friend off in Cambridge. Um, I, I, I was living in London myself, uh, but I'd, I'd gone to stay with my sister and her family for a few weeks um, mm -hmm. just to sort of chill out. And anyway, I was seeing off my friend, and I, I, she had to get back to London, so I helped her onto the train with her bags, and uh, I gave her a hug and a kiss, and we heard the, the buzzers go for the doors about to close uh, so I stepped back and as I did I left it that little bit too late and my coat got trapped in the automatic closing doors ouch so um, yeah <laughs> so um, yeah so I, I tugged real hard you know but it wasn't going to come free and uh, so I, of course I shouted for help top of my voice look for a guard there wasn't a guard on, on the platform that's fact, there's no never one a guard on the platform yeah. Well, it's it's uh, it was cuts, you know. That uh, it's um, <laughs> you know, the government cuts or whatever. So, well, that's so, it. so they decided to have um, this system where they got um, driver only, where they look into a, into the, like mm. a, a monitor at the side of the track, basically. So anyway, so I tried all that, and I banged on the side of the carriage doors, hoping that a guard would run through, you know, <laughs> or a ticket collector, indeed, you know. But nobody yeah. turned up. And I was just looking into 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 the eyes of my friend Anna, who I was seeing off, and I just saw, you know, that she was absolutely petrified because she knew that I was trapped and the engines were starting to rev up. So the train started to pull out, and it pulled out at great speed, and I just thought, this is it, you know, I'm going <clears> to <throat> die because... I'd lost my footing and I yeah. was dragged along the platform at great speed and, and the coat still wasn't coming free and I got pulled um, between the space of the platform edge and the train itself but how I went down there I'll never know because it's uh, this was not a small a, a wide gap as, as the one you talked about in Clapham this was like a very because it was a straight mm. platform but you know, it was going at such a speed that um, it, it, it had no other choice but to suck me right in. And so I went down and I just got, I was just thrown around, you know, relentlessly from pillar to post like a helpless rag doll, you know. And uh, I was conscious throughout the whole thing. And it was just like, a, it was just like this violent sort of um, experience. It was like being thrown into a, into a washing machine at full spin. And um, I um, eventually found myself hitting the ground and I was in, laid in between the in between the tracks as the train was still continuing on it was a very long train and uh you know it still wasn't over I just thought that this is it I could anything could happen now I thought I could get whacked over the back of the head by part of the undercarriage but um thankfully that didn't happen you know and it just the train eventually how moved how far on did the down. train go it went on for quite a way it, it's um because um, they did, they got no idea at all what had happened. The driver just carried on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless, he had no idea what had happened. And uh, my friend, uh, 
she kept running through the carriages trying to find somebody to stop the train. And uh, don't, don't. They... I haven't. I have Sorry, David. I haven't been yeah. on a train for absolutely years. Sure. When that happened to a friend of mine, it was the a uh, friend of my father's. That was back in the nineteen seventies. You know, when they used to have a chain that you pulled to stop yeah. the train in an emergency. Is don't they have that okay. now on trains? Well, yeah. I mean, basically, what was in place. In fact, since my accident, um, mm. six laws have been changed throughout the whole of the UK network. Okay. Um, that, that have been put in place since my accident itself. Yeah, and um, so. And one of them, and basically what happened was, I mean, my friend, I mean, she, she's, she's not that tall, but she, yeah. and she looked up and over the top of the garage, the, the doors, there's, there's, there are, there is a chain in a box. You have to smash the glass, but there's all these instructions saying, do not smash this. If you smash this, you will be fined a hundred pounds, blah, blah, blah. Do not, oh. it's all do not and do's. And, and if you're in oh. a state of shock, you don't know, you, don't you know can't take it all in. It's like, what Which, What do I do? Which one do I pull? And so, and as I say, she couldn't reach anyhow. So she figured the best thing was to run through and try and get a guard to stop the train, which she did do yeah. eventually. And the guard actually managed to stop the train. And they were in the middle of the countryside when it stopped, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it makes me think about this poor policeman that was dragged along behind that car not so long ago, know, about yeah. a year ago. Yeah. He no, didn't survive, no. did he? He didn't, no. Um, no. That, that was horrific. So, you know, um, that was horrific. And you must have had very similar experience. You know, you're being dragged yeah, along. Well, there was no way you could get away from that. No, well, that's it. I mean, there was nothing I could do about it. You know, I was just, as I say, I was just helpless to the whole thing, really. I mean, the only thing I did do, because it's interesting, because um, uh, the rail police did a, 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 a massive inquiry on it. I mean, they took mm. the carriage down to, to Finsbury Park in London and they stripped the, the whole thing down. They said they stripped the doors down to the very last rivet, you know. And uh, But at the end of their inquiries, you know, they said, uh, it's, we can't believe that you survived that. If we've done all our, on our calculations, you should not have survived. <laughs> and I said, yeah. I, I know. And I knew that a more powerful force than me and everything had, had saved me that day. But but I'll go into that later. But what is interesting is, is that uh, I said, how long did it take from the moment the train pulled out and me going yeah. under? And he said it was 13 and a half seconds, me going being dragged along the platform and under. And do you know what? It felt more like minutes because... I actually had time to think it through. I went into to a survival mode, if you like, mm. and I I remember thinking to myself, I'd, I'd seen a documentary, or no, a news item, I should say, a couple of weeks previous where a young child, an infant, had been thrown from an apartment block from the third oh, floor of a right, fire yeah. and had mm. survived. Uh, and the reason that the child survived was because infants don't tense up like we do as adults. We just kind of tense up if anything goes wrong, whereas ch children are just totally relaxed. So you I know, you, well, you, sorry, you're saying yeah. that my mother got hit by a car once on a zebra crossing, and the only reason they said that she survived, because, the, you know, she was flung a dis quite a distance, was that because she'd had a drink, right, Right, with okay. some so friends she, that she, night, she and she was floppy. Yeah, yeah. she yeah. was floppy, and if mm. she had te if she hadn't been floppy, she would have been tensed up, like you said, and she would be dead. Exactly. Yeah, mm. <laughs> she so, was drunk. People, so... she was drunk. <laughs> no, she wasn't <laughs> drunk, but she, you know, she she was a bit merry. Uh, she, she she didn't drink much. Though. Yeah. Yeah. So you are saying that I can believe that? Yeah. So, so that's what saved your life. Well, well, I, I, um, well, that what what contributed towards it, I, uh, I guess. But even so, you know, they it's I still um it's amazing how I survived it because it was just crazy. You know, I, I've it took me a, you know a lot of a lot of therapy to, to get me back on the train again. But I but I yeah. I was determined to do it. And when and when I do get on a train, which is very rare these days, but if I do. You know, I try not to look at that space in between, but some, I can't help it. And when I do look, I think, how the heck did I survive that? There's no, it's just crazy. I mean, you look at the sheer size of the train and the whole logistics of surviving something like that. I remember at the time when I got sucked under, it, and I remember it looked like the carriage doors were just disappearing into the sky. It felt like a huge drop, which it was. I mean, it's about a six-foot yeah. drop onto the... And, um, 
it felt like I was just like if, uh, the train suddenly turned into this like this huge beast. It was like a monster that was, uh, and I just thought, you're not going to beat me. You're not going to take me. You know, it was so there was this kind of will within me to to survive. And it's amazing so, yeah. as well that you stayed conscious. I know. It's, the time it's, uh, it is. Happened. It is because, that I because I, I do believe that there's a there's a natural thing that uh, um you know co- co- you know a lot of people if they're in accidents they 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 lose consciousness you know because it's almost like a, a like an not an anaesthetic but you know it, it's like what's the word on it like a shutdown to so you don't have to yeah. go through the trauma but I don't know why I guess it's because I was in that survival mode that I didn't shut down I just continued to. Um, try and fight for my life <laughs> so yeah. yeah so so how long were you how, sorry mark how long were you in hospital for oh i was do you know what i wasn't in there that, as long as they, they 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 figured when i first arrived they said you're going to be in here for for at least two months maybe three you know but i i was out in half that time oh. and and it was remarkable because uh they couldn't believe uh, just how fast I, I was um, recovering. You know, it was just—I uh, I know I was being helped. I was just—I was getting help from somewhere else, from another. You know, that was just yeah. There's a reason which, for all this. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there's a reason for it. And uh, so, and they even said to me, the, the, again, like the rail police, they were going, "We can't—we're amazed at how you're recovering so fast. You're doing great." You know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, but they've obviously seen accidents, you know. My father was a train driver, and oh, there was many a time when he had a suicide dro- a drop in front oh, of him, no. which was traumatic for him. They don't course, think about yeah, yeah. how it leaves the actual drivers of these trains, you know. Yeah, and I know. Um, yeah, well, that's it. I but, mean, well, this poor guy would have had to have gone through that as well. But, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I expect he did. What I wanted to ask, say, well, again, what I wanted to ask is you, you fell under, you got pulled under the train, and at mm-hmm. what point did you were worried about getting hit by the train or or being very seriously hurt, but yet at what point did the near-death experience come in? Well, that came um, w- when they got me into hospital. Uh, basically, the um, the ambulance guys turned up really quick, and the paramedics, you know, and they jumped down on the track and started cutting through my clothes. You know, I was, you know, I was in a pretty bad state, and but they managed some. I don't know how they did it, but they got me onto a stretcher and up onto that platform and straight into an ambulance. And um, I remember the the doctor in the back of the ambulance said, "Look, you know, with the, there's, there's a hospital around the corner that we've just come from, but there's a, there's a big one which is further on, but it's going to save your life. Can you hang on?" I said, "Yeah, let's go." So you know that the siren went on and we just took off like a rocket. And <laughs> before I knew it, I was there, and uh, there was a whole team of paramedics waiting, and, and, and doctors and surgeons and consultants, and they took me straight in. And I was just uh, I was losing a lot of blood by that stage because. Um, I, my left arm had been severed, and um, I remember seeing that one of the first because I'd seen that it was pretty gruesome, obviously. But um, it, my family had arrived as well, so they got there pretty quick. So my family had arrived, and they came in, and, and they were there in tears and talking to me. And then I could hear all the doctors, all these frantic voices going on, so trying to save me. And and it was at that point uh, when I was in the A and E department, so like the emergency, you know, and and. They, I suddenly went from all the, that trauma and pain and agony to um, basically what felt like a darkened space, like a darkened room, in fact. But when I say darkened, it was it was it was comforting. It wasn't like a sort of uh, foreboding darkness. And uh, and I, as I lay there, I suddenly realised all the pain had gone, all the trauma had disappeared instantly. And I just looked around me to see what was going on, and the, I was like being sort of calmed and comforted by these. What a, they were like pulsating lights. They were like almost like orbs of light that were slowly pulsating all around me, and all different colours of greens and yellows and ambers. And uh, I just figured straight away. I thought, well, this is it. I didn't survive. You know, I, 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 I I'm dead. I've moved on. <laughs> And I didn't reject it, you know, I didn't try to fight it or say, no, no, I'm not ready to go. You know, I just kind of like 
I didn't want to die, but I was kind of quite happy to be away from all the the horror I just experienced, you know, and it just felt brilliant to be where I was. And so I kind of like just looked around to check out what was going on, and I, and I the first thing I noticed that I was laid on. A, like a huge slate rock it was like a medieval altar it was a very, very grand sort of beautiful piece of, of slate and it felt very comfortable to lie on which is really odd so I remember I just lay my head back and as I did I just lay there and I looked up and suddenly I, there were three grids of white light started to home in on me and I couldn't take my gaze out of this light because it was just so pure and comforting and I felt like that light was healing me and um, I so just you, you and... say slate rock that's a description mm. really isn't it it may not have been made by that mat- of that material at all it may be no, something exactly. else because you say it was very comfortable and everything yeah. so yeah. you know but you know we've got a it's a, got a, this is the only way you can really describe what you were actually lying on something that looked yeah, like well, this, this is it you know um mm. it's yeah yeah i mean I, I try my best to try and put it over as you know but, mm. yeah i mean it, it, it that's what it looked like and that's what it but it didn't feel like that as i say it, yeah. it, that it wouldn't normally be comfortable because i, I i'd also realized that i was no longer clothed either so so there was no cloth or anything to or anything to material to to soften that blow of lying on slate, but it, it, it was just felt great, you know. I mean, I was covered in um, like this cloth. It was like a sort of again, it was like satin or silk, and um, I, I would describe that as as this cloth, and it was covered me, and it was like that felt very comforting. And I remember the light that was just like reflecting off it was from this white light that was coming from these grids. It was really beautiful, and I also looked to check out all my my body because all, all the pain had gone and and everything was fixed you know everything was back in place my arm was okay and there was no cuts or bruises even or, or slashes or everything was just fine and i just thought wow this is incredible and um i just laid back for a while and sort of sort of just embraced all this and then i suddenly felt like somebody was near me that like somebody was there and so I lifted my head again, and as I did, I, there was I, there was this being, uh, like an androgynous being, uh, stood there at my feet, wearing this like this very sort of contemporary simple black T-shirt, and just stood there gazing at me with this beautiful sort of um, knowing smile, just kind of comforting me, and I felt like I I knew this person, and I, I felt I know you, you know, it was just like. And um, it, he or she, because yeah, she was—it it was, as I say, it was androgynous. Had this beautiful sort of white blonde hair and this, and this pure skin that was glowing light from within, and uh, and there's uh, there's love kind of coming from this from this person as well. And I was just going, "Who are you?" And I know you, don't I? Who are you? you know? And then this this being just kept smiling back at me. And so a lot of telepathy was coming through and saying, "Just relax, just just go with it. You know, I'm here to help you." And so and so I did. So I just laid back again and uh, and closed my eyes this time for a while. And then I felt there was more people suddenly around. You do, you know, you could feel. The, yeah. If you yeah. Close your eyes. You sense that there's somebody there. You know. And I so That's I true. slowly opened them. And then I I looked, and either side of me were two. A female form, mm. and um, so and they they were the one was well, to my right was kind of more kind of uh, white Caucasian European I guess in in appearance, and again in a simple very sort of brown dress, and then the girl to my left was more uh, American Indian or Asian Indian in appearance, wearing more of a traditional sort of dress, and they both had their hands slowly hovering over my body, as if to heal me you know they were healing there was a healing process going on and the energy that was coming from their hands was just so powerful and it was just like it just felt like this sensation again of love it was like it was all the energies of love that you could ever experience throughout your life you know whether it's from 
you know, mother, father, your lover yeah. or your pet cat, you know, it's all all those essences of love all all coming through in their hands at once. So yeah, so that was that was really that was really yeah, something. You you talk about this, you know, a lot of people need that's one thing that any most people that have NDEs uh, yeah. talk about this this overwhelming love that they feel. You know, yes, my mother know. yeah, my mother, she had a tumour on the brain and she was at, in Akatamorley. Uh, they've closed down now, but Akatamorley oh. and uh, she had an eight hour operation and she said that she was in somewhere where all the walls were like cotton wool and she was sinking into them and she it was so comforting and she could feel this overwhelming love surrounding her and she just didn't want to come back. I had no idea your mother had an NDE. Yeah, I know that now. I didn't know it at the time. (laughs) Well, yeah, yeah, you never you never told that to me before. Hmm? You never told me that story before. Well, I didn't tell you the one about me, did I? I had uh, an operation also once, and I was in. A, I found myself in a room, and my there was three chairs there, all in, in like a V shape. There was my father sitting at the point at the top. I was sitting on one of the on the left, and my auntie Lizzie, who was a nurse, was sitting on the other one, and we were talking. Of course, when I come out of the anaesthetic, I'd literally done my nut because, you know, my father had been dead for 10 years or so, and I just wanted to get back to see, carry on talking with my (laughs) father. (laughs) Well, what about your auntie? Is she alive or is she passed on? She was dead too. She was dead at the time as well. Huh. But she used to be a nurse. She was a nurse. That's very interesting. You know, and I was going through an operation. It just all seemed to fit. I'll tell you more about that another time, Mark, because okay. some things <laughs> happened in that hospital which I saw that night uh, that was pretty good. I should have put it in my book. <laughs> yeah. My you should do so. Put, put right. it in the sequel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you a little bit. There was a little old lady who had Alzheimer's that was in the ward as well across from me. And I woke up early hours of the morning, and there beside her was a little old man sitting in the chair beside her, talking to her. She was sitting up in bed, and she was talking to him. And I thought, this is a weird time to have visitors, you know. (laughs) (laughs) It turns out what I was actually seeing was her dead husband, and she died not long after. Wow. Um, Wow. Did you tell her? Oh no, she would she had no. shit out so she wouldn't have remembered in the morning. They came round in the morning, the doctors and started asking her what day it was, who was the queen, all that sort of thing. Uh, okay, and so yeah. it's obviously something that they done every day to see how far it progressed. Sure. Yeah. So no, I didn't say anything to her. So no. so David, you had these two yeah. people working on you, healing mm-hmm. you light. What happened after that? Um what happened after that was um, I just lay back and, and again I just let, this, let them continue their work because I felt that the, they were healing the wounds but I felt more like they were healing my soul, you know, like the pure essence of my soul and it was just beautiful because, you know, my life before, it, you know, had taken quite a, <laughs> a rattle and it, it hadn't always been that great so it just felt like every, all the different things that had happened throughout my life had just been taken care of uh, within their hands and it was at that point that I suddenly started thinking about my family because I obviously as I say they come in to see me and my, my mother was in tears and uh, and I just thought wow she's going to be they're going to be really cut up now because I'm clearly dead so um, I thought I'd try and look over the edge of, of, the, of the big rock that I was on to see if I could see them and because um, I, you know, I, I I knew instantly that I was up, up somewhere high and I, I so as I looked over I didn't see them at all but um but what I did see was this really incredible sight. It was like a huge waterfall of stars. It was like it was like a big arc. It was almost like the size of Niagara, you know. But it, but instead of water cascading over the edge, it was it was literally you know millions of sparkling stars. And um, 
shooting star just falling right through the middle. And as I looked, I thought, wow, this is like awe inspiring. And I just kept looking. And the, the more I fo- focused my gaze, the, the further I could see, I, I kept seeing from one galaxy into another. And I thought, this is just like, I'm looking into infinity. I can't see, you know, how far this is going down. All I can see is, is beautiful colors uh, the further I look. And so, yeah, and so I, I lifted my head back over. And, um, and I, it was interesting because as I say, my life before hadn't gone too great and I was always carrying a lot of guilt and shame throughout my life and and all that had gone, I suddenly realised it because I thought to myself, normally I'd be feeling, well, oh my goodness, you know, my, for, my poor family, I've, I've caused all this mess, you know, but I didn't, I suddenly realised that, that it's not that I didn't care, but um, I didn't worry about it. I just kind of think it figured, I remember saying to myself, okay, well, they don't, they'll be fine, they're going to be up here at some point themselves and, and maybe we'll meet up, you know, when they come up here, they're going to be okay, you know. And that's exactly how I felt. So I knew at that point that all that stuff had gone and uh, um, and I realised what was basically was it, that I was looking at myself, but it, it was, again, it was the pure essence of my, my soul that was there. It wasn't just me, it wasn't me, Dave. It wasn't was you physically, no. Yeah, exactly, and and I thought this is this is what it's all about. And I'm, 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 all the stuff I carried around didn't belong to me, and mm. so that was that was a, a wonderful moment. And then the most incredible thing happened was that the, the energy of love that we talked of earlier was suddenly the it's like the dial had been turned up like tenfold. And I thought, what's going on now? You know, and uh, so. I, I again I lifted my head and I could see just coming towards me from behind the first being of light that I talked of was this yeah. huge tunnel of white light and it was just coming towards me and it was like an awesome sight it was like the pure white light in the middle that was giving out all this energy and then and it, there was like all these flames that were slowly rotating around the edge of this tunnel and I just thought wow you know this is incredible because all that energy that I was sensation that I was getting from their hands, that love, is now coming from this tunnel of white light, and it's just like pretty, pretty, pretty overwhelmingly strong, you know. And I knew again that it was all telepathy that was telling me that this is the source of all creation that I'm staring at right now. You know, this is God. It's not, you know, some guy up in the sky with a beard or whatever God that you know that that um, we may worship here on earth you know it's not in a human form it's it's a it's this literally it's this tunnel of white light and that was the that was what i saw and that's what i felt and uh and it was pretty much at that stage that i just kind of i just i kind of tossed my head back and laughed i remember because i thought this is incredible that and that i lay back down again and then suddenly I was back in my body. I was like sort of came crashing back down to earth and I was back in the hospital, you know, and all the the noise was kind of on overdrive and all the, the light was just too much for me to stare into and it was just like the pain came that. rushing through and I was back. But, um, you know, but you know what? I didn't, I didn't care. I did, it was fine. You know, a lot of people say to me, oh, you must have felt really disappointed. But um, I didn't do because I was just so charged with all the energy that I just experienced and all the knowledge that I just gained that I was just, all I could think of was, right, why have they sent me back? What is my mission now? What I've, I've got something to do here. And what is it, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. And before you knew it, I was being wheeled straight into the, into the operation theatre and then they, you know, and uh, they said, right, we're going to, we're going to put you so under that. So all well, this happened before the operation itself. Yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. I yeah. thought so, they were so, already operating on you. No, no, uh, no. I know. You're not the first to say that because I guess a lot of people who mm. do have NDEs when they're actually either comatized or uh, un- yeah. under anaesthetic. But I was uh, fully conscious, and so, um, so yeah, but. Um, yeah, so I hadn't gone into theatre, but I, I, I did do it. I mean, I went in, they operated for about eight hours, the first operation they did. And so, yeah, it was kind of like, 
I, I was I, I got I got my own room because obviously this, because of the severity of the accident they they given me my own room which is great actually <laughs> it's just like nice to have that and and I needed that space because of, when I first came around it was in the middle of the night and I remember I, it was it was a double edged sword you know part, part of me was dealing with the the actual human horror of what just happened to me in the accident itself I was in shock yeah. for that but. There was a major part of me who was really more excited about what had just happened and how I was going to tell the world about this because I knew nothing about NDEs at that point. I heard I heard nothing about them and I just figured, not arrogantly, just I just figured that you know, all right, I'm the only person that this has probably happened to, you know, and yeah. I've got to somehow break this to to the to people and and how, are they going to believe me and, and and what have you but actually more importantly i was more scared that i was going to forget what I, what had happened and i thought i've got to i've got to sort of do i've got to document this and i thought the only way i could, I could think of it at that stage was i'm going to do a painting i've never done anything like it before but i thought i'm going to do a huge painting it's got to be like a, a Michelangelo, it's got to be a, like a big Renaissance style, you know, the painting that you see in the Vatican in Rome, you know. That's, and that's and you were not an artist before this, no. No, not at all. I mean, I, I was, I was, um, I was making. I'd left school without qualifications, okay. so you know, I was just tr- picking up manual labouring work, basically. Uh, so it was all, I was living, you know, day to day, sort of uh, <laughs> going down to the local pub and uh, hustling work um, uh, mm. each, each evening. And so yeah, so, but I, it didn't matter because I just, I, I didn't really, I just figured. I don't know, it wasn't like I'd suddenly been given this. This, this um, I didn't know I, I was going to be able to do it, but I, I didn't care. I thought, no, I'm going to do it. That, nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to do a huge painting, and that's it. And uh, I decided right from the off that's what was going to happen. With um, yeah. the surgery that they performed on you, you said your arm was severed. Were they able to reattach it, or did you lose your arm? Yeah, well, interestingly enough... Um, the uh, the consultant uh, the surgeon who operated on me he just started at the hospital and he was a great guy and and I remember saying to him as I was going in I said I said um, can you save my arm don't take my arm off will you please save it you know and uh, and he said um, I'll try my best and I think because he was new he was just keen and and I I was like his first big job you know and so I think that he really wanted to sort of. Well, he did. He told me afterwards. He said, "You're like my kind of like my star, sort of a patient. You know, he's just like I really want to make this happen." So he did. He he. I. It took three eight-hour operations to save it, but uh, they managed to save it. I mean, it's not fully functioning, you know. But wow, you know what they did was remarkable. They managed to sort of like, you know, stitch a lot of tendons back together. I mean, all, my, all the bones were just like as it was completely shattered. He said that you know he said it, it's on a he said it's on a metal brace and they're going right down your arm. But he said it looks like a you know Cotswold stone wall. This is like <laughs> you know it's all just like bits of rock or but, but that's but they did it and it's remarkable. It's remarkable what, what they did. So I'm very lucky. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing what they can do. Mm. Yeah. So. Um... Oh, gosh, what was I going to say? I was going to say something then, Mark, and forgot. Oh, brain fart again. It's the old age setting in. It is the old age. It's got to be. <laughs> oh, God. So, yeah. Well, well, while you're, while she's trying to remember her question, um, so, <laughs> so you, you had the surgeries, you're, you're on the road to recovery, and then did you still fully remember the uh, near-death experience, or did that memory fade and have to come back a while later? I mean, I mean, how were you yeah. feeling in the days and weeks following? Um, it didn't go at all. No, uh, it was that's what was interesting. Um, yeah, I remember my sister came in to see me the, the very next night, and you know, she said, "Is there anything I can get you?" And I said, "Yeah, can you get me a sketch pad and a, and a pencil?" <laughs> so she did. And I remember I did this, this very faint sketch of what I'd seen, um, which is pretty much v- looks very true to the very first painting that I did, which wasn't to be that was that was quite a few you know, a couple of months on until I could actually do that. But um, no, I didn't forget anything because I was so fully charged with this energy as well. I mean, I mean, my family and my friends would come in to, to visit me, and they were going. 
I, I can't get over this. He said, we're coming to see you. And, yeah, you look pretty wrecked. You can't even move. You've got tubes coming out of you. You know, you're wired up to machines. But you've got this, like my mum said, you're, you're glowing. Whenever we come in, you're just kind of glowing and you're re- radiating this kind of, like, care to everyone who's around you, you know, right down to the nurses. And, and I was. And, I, you know, I'm not trying to say that I was just like this heavenly saint or anything, but it was just that um, it was just that I knew that I was still charged with the energy from the other side. I felt like I'd still got like this um, umbilical cord attached to it. You know, there the, was the energy that was still flowing through from them and, and they, were, they were helping me. So it never went and it, it never has done. So there's no, you know, it's, it's stayed with me now and it's just... Um, uh, you know, I, I once I done once I started that first painting, it was interesting because um, I was I'd got the canvas there. I got this big canvas, and it was leaning against the wall. I, I, re, I when I came out of hospital, I, I, it, you know, there was a lot of months of recuperation, and I stayed at my sister's house, this the house up in Cambridge where where they were living, and uh, they give me my own room, and I remember seeing this canvas against the wall, and I was very apprehensive about starting it because I thought, can I pull this I off? I can't that mess this up. Yes. Yeah, I used to do watercolours. I used to stand there looking at it blank for a long time. And um, what did you find? Did you find I wanted to I waited for the urge to come. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Now my easel and everything is under the stairs and it's been there for 10 years now. I haven't touched it. Oh, right. Well, I thought, you know, with uh, with lockdown, that would have been the perfect opportunity to pull it out. (laughs) Well, I'll carry on with the books. Oh well, there you go. You've been doing it. That's fine, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But it's just saying. So, it's, but I say that because it's it's interesting how many people did mm, start painting no, and getting creative. Me, you know, when 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 the uh, when the whole COVID thing first kicked off. Yeah. You know. So, oh, yeah. I cleaned out the greenhouse and plant. I've done some seedlings and one thing or another. That's what took my time. But so you've got this blank canvas. Yeah. And you stand um, there and you look at it. And I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, uh, I'm putting it off. And then a friend of my sister's turned up one day and her and her husband run uh, like a yoga Pilates centre. And they said, look, we've got a spare room. How's that painting coming on? So I haven't started yet. And then they said, well, look, we've got a a spare studio up in the attic that's free for a week because we're decorating them. Yeah. Come and do it there. So, okay. So I went in, I've got no choice but to start. So I, I started... And, uh, you know, of course, I didn't finish it by the end of the week. But uh, once I got started, I was amazed by how it was all coming together. It was just like the paint was going on there. And and, and I was suddenly creating all these colors and textures. And it was becoming three-dimensional really quick. And I thought, wow, this is remarkable. And people were from the centre starting to come up because they, t- Jane and Richard, who run it, they've become friends now because they turned around and they got to the end of the week and they said, you're clearly not going to get this finished. And they said, mm-hmm. you can stay. And, we'll, and I said, I thought you needed it back. They said, no, we'll move you around, you know. So they did. So I stayed there for two years in the end. <laughs> I was so, just really... Yeah, Sorry? In, the, in the very beginning then, you didn't obviously didn't know how to mix colours or anything like that. Did it just no. come automatically to you? you were you what suddenly just mixing was, colours to get the colour that you just, wanted? Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I realised that I was, I was being helped. Basically, I was, I was channeling um, energy oh. through, and that was helping me to mix mm. the colours and not even think about it and just do it and just put those that paint very. I was, I was being very brave and bold with what I was doing as well. I realised that was the way forward was just to get, just to do it, you know, and be and be brave. And I don't know what I don't know what it is. I still don't know because I still do now. Whatever I do, I, you know, I still paint and I'm and I write music and and I'm being helped and I still know that I'm I'm being educated from from another source and they're giving me this inspiration to to suddenly like for example with skin colours. You know, yeah. I just when I started off, I just mixed a color that I thought looked like a skin color, and that was it. And then I realized as I was going along that I'd have like happy accidents where like I'd suddenly splash some green on there, and I think, oh no, what's that? And I was going, hang on, that looks great. That's given the skin a, a, a new dimension. So I started putting in different colors, and so all the skin tones started to develop with all these different colors that I would never have thought of. And um, so, yeah, do, do you know, David? They say 
that um, we have spirit guides, okay? And spirit guides are not like guardian angels. Guardian angels are have never lived on the earth plane where spirit guides have. They've been down on the earth plane. And they say that I remember reading years and years ago, well, I, I think it was reading where I was told about the fact that a spirit guide, if you wanted to learn to play the piano for a start, then you would attract a spirit guide that would, was a pianist in life and mm. that can help you to learn the piano. So maybe yeah. with your painting, what you were doing, you were, and your music, you were uh, attracting two different spirit guides that actually were in that profession when they were alive. Have you ever Absolutely. tried to find out or see whether any of the oldies or anything, artists, had a similar way of painting to you? Oh, Can yeah, totally, out? yeah. Yeah, you have checked uh, you know, that out. It, it, yeah, you know, I mean, I'll watch, I'll watch TV programs now, and 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 I'll just and I'll just look at, at various uh, artists, you know, like like Rembrandt. There you go, Rembrandt. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very good example. You know, I watched a program on him one one day, and they weren't really talking about it, but they were just showing his paintings, and I and I just thought I was going to call done, you Rembrandt same... just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, something you said, and I said I was I was going to say just like Rembrandt. Oh, well, there That's you go. That's what I was going to so say we're, when you were, were describing what you were page. painting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, carry on. No, that's fine. That's, that's, that's cool. Well, you, you, you've, you've got what I'm talking about. That's lovely. But yeah. I, so yeah, so I, when I looked at Rembrandt, and I thought because they talk about Rembrandt's and um, in that program they were talking about his skin how the, how, the, how the skin looks luminous and alive and and stuff and I thought well hang on he's doing that same thing he's got he's got green greens and and sort of aqua colors in the skin as well you know and he's done that they're a lot more subtle you know mine they're quite bold sort of <laughs> that's it there's green on there or whatever but but even so yeah you know, I, I realize that but more so with the music i'm really realizing that now hearing stuff i mean when i first started writing music i had i'd, I'd had no classical training i'd had no classical I, I didn't even listen to classical music the only classical music i knew was when i'd heard it say in a film soundtrack you know and so when i first started doing that that was a different thing altogether it was like it was like i got a new tool to sort of because the first piece of music I wrote was about my near death experience. It was called The Divine Light, um, which is based on the tunnel of white light. And and it's interesting because the, uh, an orchestra performed it, and the conductor of the orchestra turned around to me afterwards when, after the rehearsal, and he and he said, "Oh, this part, this some of your work reminds me of." Um, of Debussy and I was going oh right and and I'd never heard of Debussy or well I'd heard the name but I didn't know any of his music you know and he said a piece that it sounded like so that was interesting so I thought well there you go so I what I wasn't there was no there was no plagiarism going on there at all you know I was obviously channeling ideas through from someone yeah. like Debussy that was giving me those that was helping me to put those core progressions together that were very similar to to, to, to that so yes yeah, so I firmly believe what you're saying there uh, happens and, and and happens to a lot of people and that definitely was happening with me yeah. well I've got a confession to make David mm, great <laughs> I write spy books as you know or you may uh, know I write spy yeah. books and I always have music blaring in my ears. And majority of the time, I, I have whatever type of music is helps me with the scene that I'm writing, if you understand oh, what I mean. Brilliant. Yeah, I okay? do. I totally get that, actually. Yeah. And I did go on to YouTube, and I did find a YouTube thing, a uh, little snippet on YouTube, where this orchestra was playing some of your music. And I, oh, right. yeah. so what I did, I wrote a scene in the book as I listened to that very loudly through, because I have it full volume. I have it full volume Fantastic. when I'm when I'm writing uh, on coming through earphones. And mm. I wrote a scene in my book to your music. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And I'm not going to tell you what scene it was. No, no, but, but I hope you do. <laughs> I when, would, when the I would, of... but, you know... Yeah. <laughs> but well, you know you I... need that it's like when you're writing uh it's an art it's an art form as well you know when i'm writing i'm listening to music if there's in the book there's a uh uh a segment coming up where 
you know, there's going to be an assassination or something, then the music comes to a crescendo and I can write it. I can yeah. write exactly. Yeah. It's like putting the music into the words on into the book. Synchronicity. You, that's, what, that's what's going yeah. on there. That's brilliant. Yeah. So I have to admit, I did write that's a fantastic. little piece of that book. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honoured. I, I really am. That's, that's mm. beautiful. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Well, I have to listen to some more now. If, it, if you go onto the website, you, you can hear all three of the movements there. You can stream them on there if you go to my website. I will. So, I will. Yeah, I'll download them as well so that, you know, I can do, do more from yeah, it. Yeah. Well, well, in fact, I'll send, I'll, I'll send you something. And you've got, then you've got the full lot because that would be lovely. If you yeah. if you're listening to it when you're writing, that's, that's that's great. But I know what you mean. I, I I'm exactly the same. You know that I can't work in silence. Whatever I'm doing, right. whether it's you know, it, it's uh, even when I'm working on my music, I've got to have I'll, mm. I'll have a, a, an old movie on in the background on the TV, <laughs> something like that. I I just and I think it kind of I don't know what it is. It just helps you, doesn't it? It just yeah. it just um it takes away that that sensation of just having like this blank sheet in front of you and it's just and then it's saying right okay what are you going to do now kind of thing it's just it helps it to flow yeah it is it, it does help it to flow like i say especially if, if music you know if it is a part where it is going to be uh very difficult to write like a killing or something or like an assassination or car bombs going off or something you know you've got like send up bang bang in your ears <laughs> going off it's so much easier to put it down it really yeah. is. And then you've got Cinematic. the love scenes, so you have the love <laughs> songs, you know, the oh. soft and the silly, you know, them type of songs going yeah, on. Sure. And uh, that's the secret of writing most spy books, people. So <laughs> there you know now. <laughs> There's only a few people actually know I do that. Scott McCune being one, or Agent McCune, should I say. Anyway. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so that's... You'd never ever written music. You'd never studied music in any way. No, I mean, I, I, I played guitar, um, but it was like thrashing out three chords, you know, in, in yeah. uh, sort of, you know, bands trying to do the circuits. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but that's nothing like classical music. Let me let me tell you. I mean, it's just well, like you... you do need to be classically trained to do this. I mean, in fact. The conductor well, you, actually turned around to me, and you, you um, have I to said, write all the scores for the different instruments, don't you? Yeah, coming yeah. In, um, you know? I, well, exactly, exactly how that, what I had to do. I mean, it all started one afternoon. I just, uh, I got this. Um, I'd been going for spiritual healing. I discovered there was a spiritualist church in yeah. the town where I was recovering, and I was having spiritual healing. And the healers there were, where some of them were clairvoyant, and there was one in particular, and she kept turning around and she was saying, oh, "I'm just." I'm, I'm, why am I seeing a violin across your chest while I'm healing you? And I said, I've no idea. You know, then then another one would say, I'm I'm hearing, Va I heard Wagner and Beethoven while I was healing you. I was going, great, you know. And then this one healer turned around and she said, look, they're telling me that you're going to write a piece of music about your experience. And I thought, right, okay, let's go for it, you know. And I, because, I, as I say, I'd only played in, in bands, I couldn't play guitar anymore anyway because my, my left arm had been bashed up that it wasn't fixed to be able to do that. So I got this old cheap synthesizer out of the cupboard and I just was playing around on that one afternoon. And again, I was watching a movie on the TV and, then, and while I was watching that movie, these three that's just lovely chords came through. And I thought, oh, that's nice. I like that. So I just recorded. All I got was a basic cassette recorder, and I recorded it onto that. And mm. then I started developing it from that stage. And I thought this should be played by an orchestra. So again, I got that same sense of ambition when I was in lying in the hospital, thinking I was going to do a Michelangelo style painting. I thought this has got to be played by orchestra. So um, as you say, yeah, each instrument had to be dealt with, you know. For, so my brother. Um, who's who? Lives, he's in South London as well, and, and so he he said he said, look, I've got um, 
I've got this computer package that you can, it's like a software that you can load onto, onto your laptop. And uh, while you're playing your synthesizer, it, 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 it will transpose the notes that you're playing and it will come up as the notation that you need. It will write out musical notation for each yeah. in, individual instrument. So I would hear instruments. So I, I'd, I'd say to myself, I'm, I'm hearing, this sounds like a horn, you know. So I realised that was a French horn and then so, and then I'd hear flutes and stuff. So, so yeah, so I'd write all those parts in and then I just printed them off and then I, I got friendly with a cello player who was coming up to see my paintings at the yoga centre and I told her what I was doing and she said, oh, maybe we could perform it and laughed and I thought, right, I'm going to hold you to that. So I kept developing up what I was doing and then I... I met her for coffee one day and I said, look, do you remember that conversation we had? Well, how about, you know, would you have a look at it? And then she said, yeah. So the orchestra looked at my score and they said, okay, we'll do it. So they said, we'll perform it. And, um, uh, you know, it was, yeah. uh, that was quite an amazing journey because they turned around and said, look, do you mind saying a few words to the local press just because we normally do that and because you're a composer? And, and I said, sure. So I did, and the local press knew straight away who I was because I'd been all over the over the news. It was good. Yeah. The, you're the guy who went under the train, you know. So, so <laughs> I was. They, they said, we, "This is going on the front page," and so it did. And then the phone kept ringing, and then other people would start getting in touch, and and then the BBC said, "We want to come and interview you and film you with rehearsing," and so they did. So this concert sold out two weeks in advance, which was like. For the orchestra it was like what <laughs> this is brilliant you know and um so but i knew i'll tell you what then i knew then that i was wasn't just being helped by my guides um uh, to create the music itself and the art that they were actually helping to pull this whole event together you know they were helping yeah. with them the marketing if you like you know they're helping to make that all those different people come across my pathway you know so there was a lot of synchronicity was happening so so yeah. you went from being somebody who was going from one job to another to a survivor to an artist and a composer that's right yeah this yeah. all seems pretty remarkable but all through <laughs> all because of this accident yeah amazing exactly. isn't it mark actually it's fascinating now i i know that uh there are people who have had near-death experiences and they come back with uh, psychic abilities of some kind. You know, I know you've gotten the painting and the music. Has Have you had any other types, uh, anything else happen, like being intuitive or seeing or hearing things? Um, not really, no. I, I'm, not, I'm definitely not clairvoyant, I know that much, um, because I've met so many people since uh, who are. Um, but I'm very aware of, let's say, that um, of... Um, I mean, there's been certain things that have happened. I'm, I'm, I'm aware when, when my guides are with me, when they're, when they're working with me, or if I call upon them, you know, and, I, and there's certain little signals that I know that I sense. Like when I, 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 go to, I still go to spiritual healing every week, not really just to, to be healed. I mean, sometimes I need healing, you know, sometimes, but that's normally even emotional stuff, you know, but, or, or, or I might be going through a tough time in, in my life, you know, but, um, and as soon as I walk in that room and sit down, I can feel straight away that there's energy going through my forehead before it even started the healing, you know, for wow, you know, so I'm, I sense all things like that. And, uh, but I wouldn't say that I've, I've developed anything more than that. You know, it's just, I, I guess basically, Mark. You know, they just they. My quest was just to come back and sort of tell as many people about what happened to me and about, you know, that that death is not to be feared and 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 there's, what awaits us all is quite beautiful. And uh, um, so my quest is to sort of put that message across. It's been through my paintings and through my, my music and and now through my book and and. Uh, you know, coming on here and talking to people like yourself and, you know, chatting about it through the spoken word. So so it, that's quite new for me as well. You know, I mean, I never would have done that before. I, I wouldn't have strung t two or three words together if I'd been on the radio before. But, sorry, um, sorry about this. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> she <laughs> just joined her, her British bulldog Gertie is uh, wanting to be a part of the show. 
<laughs> um, yeah. Hello. Now, now, when when you were having your experience, I, I again a, a, a few near death experiencers, they report when they're over there, they're given a choice on whether or not to come back. Did did you seem right. like that you were ever given that choice that you could have stayed if you wanted to? No, I, I wasn't. I certainly wasn't given a choice. Um, I think I, my take on it is is that they've made their minds up that um, I was ready to come back and uh, and I, that I was I wanted to get on with, with the job because I did straight away. You know, when I came through from the anaesthetic, I was lying there thinking I I, I really want to. You know, they've sent me back for a reason, and I want to follow this through. I want to honour it, if you like. You know, which I've never stop doing so so it's been a, you know it's never kind of fallen out of my my lifespan you know it's, it's something that's been that's still very that's been important to me right from day one but so i so no they didn't i the choice was made by them but i didn't feel any sense of like oh but i wanted to stay there I, you know it was lovely i was quite happy to stay there and uh but the, no the, the choice was made from the other side yeah now, have you um, ever like? Hmm, it's the best way to to ax this. Um, have you have have ever had any dreams or any intense experiences, or or tried through meditation to achieve uh, any higher levels of consciousness? Um. Yeah. Um. I, Going back to the spiritual healing, that's the nearest I come to it. Actually, that's one of the reasons I like to go back uh, each week because that's that's my sort of, if you like, my my church. You know, that's me going to to touch base. You know, a lot of people go to church to to pray to whatever their faith is, and then and they're, they're connecting with that with that faith. And um, for me, spiritual healing, uh, that's the nearest I come to to touching base with my guides and, and the universe and the other side that I, that I was in and when I go into that moment of being healed it's it's something else it's absolutely beautiful and the energy that comes through is really powerful and uh, and you know there's normally one or two healers working on each person at a time and they are basically you know the amount of times I've turned around to them and said wow you, you're that was brilliant you're, you're such a great healer and they'll all turn around and say no we're not great healers it's we're just conducting the energy so they're channeling the energy as well so so it, if, if that's the case if i've had a really powerful session of healing that they feel it as well so so i know that it's that it's for sure because I've, when i come through or whatever you know come back from the healing and i, and I go wow that was really deep that was really profound and they go yeah and they have to sit down themselves and they and we just kind of sit there looking at each other and we don't speak for a while we're just kind of like still in the moment so that energy is really quite intense yeah so so that's that's probably the closest i come to it and you know there are times when i do have to stop and if i'm not being healed if something's happened in my life you know i stop and ground myself and try and connect and uh, so so yeah that's that's the nearest i come to it now you do a lot of speaking engagements uh and promoting for promoting your book. Do you have anything uh yeah. coming up here soon that you want to promote? Um well basically I mean the main thing I am promoting is the book itself. You know, it it came out um June the 26th. So, um, you know, so it's been a, you know, so it's been still a, a question of me just pushing that at the moment. I mean the, the next Thing after that will be music. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking about put, putting a compilation of all because I've done quite a bit of music. I did, from that first piece of music, I got commissioned from then on, you know, straight away. And so there's lots of other music that I'd like to put together as a compilation. So, but at this stage, it's it's the book. I really you know love people to if they're interested, if they've been enjoying what I've had to say, to go and read the book because it's it's not just. Uh, it's not just about my NDE. It is about my story, uh, as you pointed out um, earlier, Irene. You know, coming from, you know, my life before was just basically, you know, picking up work wherever I could, um, which a lot. And then now it's a lot more three dimensional, and, and so it's 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 talking about that journey, and it's talking about talking about what how I learned to sort of basically find 
belief in myself to be able to do all this and and that, so it's it's we can all do that is basically what i'm saying and and i think that most people who've read the book feel that you know it's it's a, it's a it's a feel good book and um so you know if people want to read it please uh, yeah go and have a look at that so you can if, you, if oh, basically if you go to my website that's probably the best thing because the, the website is like the main hub because you can listen you can stream the music the first piece of music the, the divine light and you can look at my paintings so so if 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 you, if, if you don't mind me saying what that is which is no um, go ahead promote it so, yeah so great fantastic yeah. at the moment yeah yeah I, I do i have one behind me mm. Yeah. Sure. On the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I do, yeah. I've got a few. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I can't remember. It's too far away. But you remember those little hopper balls that we used to hop around on? Mm hmm. Yeah. I feel like there's someone sitting on one of them. I don't know why. <laughs> <But sorry. laughs> it's a round, round thing. I can see yeah. the round shape. Oh, behind okay. you. What? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, oh. and I, I, the only thing I can do is think of is that it must be a painting because it's right. a small, small round shape in a bigger area. Hmm. Okay. I mean. And there's more to the left of it, more colours on the left. Yeah. Of this, uh, right. what I'm focusing on. Interesting. Well, you uh, should uh, go to his website because uh, he has uh, most of his yeah, paintings be... listed there. Have you got them on there? Oh, I'll yeah, pick it yeah, out. they're on the website. Yeah, yeah. So, can, yeah, so, yeah, so the, have a look because what actually the painting? Oh, sorry, the, the painting behind me is actually a, a, a painting of Christ. And that's on there. So, uh, so well, that's this round shape. This, right? Oh yeah, the the, the, round shape the painting there. of Christ has that round circular thing behind him. What is that supposed to be? That's right. Yeah, that, that, that is that's interesting because again, I was channeling ideas through, and I got I was, I was painting Christ, and I and I wanted to paint. The reason I painted Christ was because he was coming through in the in the healing sessions, and the, and the healers were saying to me I, I had this one healing session and i saw this image of christ uh, hovering above me and I, I came through from it and and uh, and then the healer turned around and said oh you know you had christ with you throughout that healing i said oh wow that's that's mad because i actually saw him as well so we just loved it you know and i just so i thought i've got to paint that so i painted him as i saw him and as i was doing it i'd left the space above to do the halo and I thought, I don't want to just do the usual kind of halo that you see, which is like a thin like, white line. I wanted to paint what I, uh, the kind of lights that I was seeing throughout my healing sessions then. Uh, and so that's, that's the kind of images that I was seeing above me in, in, the healing, in the spiritual healing sessions in his halo. And I thought, why, why not? Let's give him a nice big grand <laughs> halo, something to you know, really show off. So that's what that is. So maybe that's what you were thinking of. Then that's great that you thought about. Yeah, is that is that what's behind you then? I just yeah, I just sent you the link. Me, the I just sent you the yeah. link to the painting, Irene. Take a look at it. You know, it's funny because to me, the painting, the halo behind him almost looks like a UFO. Mm. Because it has like yeah, know, that's what the different symbols yeah, or things around it. It almost it almost looks metallic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hang on a minute. I can't open it up. I do funny things like this. You'll have to excuse me, Dave. But, Don't worry about it. You know, it. these you weird things happen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't but, open uh, it up. Not, not while I'm online. Oh, not while I'm talking. But, well, you can look I'm at it after the this. show. I'm trying on another computer. <laughs> Well, right. So there's also a, there was another question I wanted to ask you. Mm. Um, have you any idea, or has anybody at the spiritualist church told you who your spirit guides are? Um, well, uh, I know or who yeah, you've been my, my, channeling. Yeah. No. Well, in terms of uh, when you say spirit guides, people who've been, who've been on the earth plane, um, relatives right. of past. I mean, I. When I first started going to the uh, to the spiritualist church, I, I went to a couple of their you know their sort of um, their services, and they would have a medium at the end of it, like a guest medium who travel yeah. from parts of the country, and uh, and I was getting picked out 
pretty much every week because I was still got all this energy, obviously, from the other side, I think, you know, and I figured that's yeah. why. And so it became like a, a joke, you know, they, 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 everyone would laugh. They go, oh, it's David again, you know. <laughs> but do you know what? It was great because um, my grandfather came through many a times. So I knew that he was with me because um, because there were so many people saying it. And then there was one week, this is great, because um, – Somebody turned around and said, oh, and he was brilliant. He was getting so many things right. And he said to me, he said, um, I'm, go- I'm picking up um, somebody who's with you now who had a motorcycle crash. Do you know, somebody had a mo- with motorcycle. I said, no, I don't even know anyone who rides a motorcycle. He said, well, you know, he said, well, no, it's definitely that. And, he's, and he wouldn't let go of it. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't take that. And I found out quite recently that um it was a really good friend of mine and we used to when we were young we used to ride an old, old motorbike over this quarry and uh, together and uh we were really good friends i've been trying to trace him down for years and i through facebook i managed to get in touch with some, some old school friends who got in touch with me actually and i just read this post where there was there they got an old photograph of all the kids and then they were going oh you know that's that's michael um he he, he died in a, in, a, in a motorcycle crash on on uh, you know like some 10 years ago and I was going oh my goodness I had no idea that he died so there you go he'd come through so he was with me he was yeah. helping me because uh, uh, and so that that was remarkable but I, I didn't know it at the time I just no, I didn't realise it until I found out later that it was actually him that had died but um, yeah so but other than that there were mainly family members like an uncle who passed on and so so the mainly family members and and this other friend who was we were just such close friends you know and so it's it lovely to know that he's around uh-huh. uh. yeah hang on a moment uh mark has just sent me these paintings i'm trying oh, to great, see yeah. wait a second uh, this computer is so slow when we're doing this uh i think you've sent it I'm not loading it. Well, I sent you a link, and that didn't seem to work, so I, like, downloaded the photo and just tried to attach it to you, send it to you. Okay, it'll come up in a minute, I expect, because I'm on on that page now. Mm-hmm. But I can't get the Skype to open up on the other one, so maybe they're not wanting me to see this. Maybe <laughs> not right now. Huh? Oh, well. Um... Oh, there it is. Oh, I'm looking yeah, for a painting. Got I've got to open it, haven't I? Yeah. Ooh. Me. All right, so right. Sorry about this, people. I just want to see if it's a painting that I just seen. But also, there's something else that struck me with you. You said you feel this energy on your forehead. Now, this is where I get it, right between, right in the center of my forehead. Mm, it is it, yeah. a sensation. I, I don't know whether I can call it an energy, but it is the sensation that I get there when I'm channeling stuff or when stuff is happening with me or when I'm doing remote viewing or whatever. You know, it's uh, it's this feeling I get there. And I also get something in the top of my head occasionally as well, but majority of the times... It's, yeah, that's um, true. I get the top of the head as well, but it yeah. is, it's, it's strange, isn't it? it? It to me, it almost feels like it's like this, like you know, the size of a golf ball <laughs> on my forehead, and and it's like it's like a tube of energy is just coming yeah. straight in at me, and and I just just think, oh great, you know. It, I always joke with them at the uh, afterwards, and I always say that it's. I feel like I've just been. I go there to get plugged into the mains to get everything <laughs> recharged, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when when, does it, when this happens to you, do you um oh uh where am I? I can't get it open yet. Uh, uh this painting's throwing me at the moment because I can't open it up because no Skype's playing me up at the same time. Yeah. But when you when you get that sensation, is that when you get your best work? Is that when you actually become creative? No, I don't, there's, there's, uh, not really. I mean, I think that when I'm talking about that happening, that's more when I'm actually, you know, sort of 
Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. No, I it, I don't really get that. I'm not really aware of that happening when I'm when I'm painting. No, I, I I don't know how it comes through there. It just just happens, you know. And I I just don't force it either. I just allow it to come through. It's, yeah. it's a very kind of serene sort of process, basically. Um, but it's more intense when I'm actually going for healing that energy that's coming through. And in fact, I remember one of the, one of the healers was talking to me the other day and she was saying about she said she, she can remember when i uh, after my accident when i when they first started working on me this is why i was recovering so fast because i was having the spiritual healing and she said that um that she said that you used to start to levitate from from the bed when when we were healing you in the early days and i remember that as well and i thought it was just my arm that was like that was being lifted but i felt like that was that something else was taking over me while I was being healed in that process. It wasn't just them, the actual physical healers, you know, there was, there was more going on. So, so that was quite remarkable. Yeah. And, and, and she talked about that and that's, and I said, is that something you've had before? She said, no, <laughs> but she was yeah. very sort of calm about it, but, you know, and loved it, you know, but, um, so, um, yeah, but, but no, when I'm painting, as I say, when I'm painting or when I'm writing music, I, I, I'm not really aware of it. I'm, and I'm not aware of it until after I've done it. Say, for example, with the music, mm. if 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 a, if a lovely passage, to, well, sounds lovely to me anyway, comes through and I think, oh, that's great, you know, I just know that I've just been helped. And I always kind of sit back in my chair and look up and go, thank you so much. <laughs> because, <laughs> and I I thank them all the time because they, you know, they why not? You know, they're helping me through, and it's just that's how I communicate with them. It's not like, you know, I look at, and uh, I've been to various churches for, from for various things, and I and and I, you know, and I've realised it's that it, it's taken so seriously a lot of, um, a lot of a lot of faiths are when you go into a church, and I, I figure my faith is not. I think you've got to have a sense of humor and you've got to be real and just just it's you can just be in the moment it doesn't matter you know you can just turn around and have fun and and you know it's uh, I mean when I ask for help for example with my guides if I need help I will ask them I'm humble but I'm only humble in the sense that if I ask say if, if I was at, to ask the nearest person who was helping me who was going to give me some help or advice in my life i'd be humble with them i don't kind of get to the state where i feel like i'm not worthy and of their of their love and their help i just open myself up to it so yeah yeah so with with your experiences do you know if you've actually helped other people come to terms with uh prior you know similar things that have happened to them yeah, well, I have done. Um, yeah, most certainly. I mean, the the very first the concert that I did, uh, uh, as I say, it sold out, and there was quite a few people turned up to that who'd had similar, either similar things happen to them, or they just lost somebody, and so, and they got in touch with me afterwards and said how much it had helped them that just hearing my music. Uh, but I mm. found more; it's been more intensely so in the last. Uh, uh, year because uh, I started doing a lot of interviews before the book came out to start promoting the book and um, so a lot of people have got in touch with me since and you know who follow me you know through my Facebook feed or Instagram or my YouTube channel and stuff like that so people get in touch with me there and then they'll 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 talk to them and I'll, I'll always respond you know if people say look I've just lost somebody or or some people or some people are really ill or some people are scared of dying and 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 that's great and that's great for me to be able to do that because it's it's i felt that was one of the most important things to me right from the off that i wanted to be able to help people overcome the fear of death and so um, yeah i i yeah there have been quite a few people that i feel that, that uh, it, well they've told me that it's helped them so so i'm, I'm saying yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> hopefully yeah i mean i'll go you know i've not gonna i've, I've got it <sighs> yeah i'm oh. hoping that's going to be the case i really do so so do you think that's one reason why you they sent you back uh, yeah that's what i figure so i mean it's just uh we just don't we don't talk about death at all, really, you see, do we, in the Western civilization? And it's not like I feel that we should be talking about it every day over our morning coffee or whatever, but, you know, 
I think we should all at least address it at some point because it's going to happen. <laughs> so we may as well just uh, just uh, try and uh, approach it, you know. And so I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not somebody. I'm not trying to push this on anybody. I just don't want to do that, Jess. I mean, it's never been my, my sort of my my bag to do that. Um, yeah. So if people want to hear, if people want to ask me about it and talk about it and listen to my story or look at my paintings or whatever, then that's great. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I've been, I've met so many other people now who've had NDEs and they're out there. They're doing the same thing, you know. They're for they're not doing paintings and music, for example, but but they're getting out there and they're doing talks. They're going around the world and they're talking about their near death experience. And and they're exactly like me. They want people to overcome um, the, the fear that you know, of death because because we all say the same thing, and that is, you know, that it's. It's it's the next stage of the journey, basically. It's it's uh, you know the soul lives on. Okay, yeah, the body switches off like a light switch and dies and and decays, but the soul continues onwards, and 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 that's what I really want people to to try and grasp and understand. And uh, yeah. yeah. So, David, so, where can people find your book? Yeah, well, um, I mean, if you if you want to buy it, um, Amazon really is is probably your best bet because it's 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 selling worldwide and and it's it, it's we're getting great reviews, you know, th- throughout all the Amazon sites. So please go and have a look on there. Um, but if you want to go to my website, um, which is uh, it, that's called shineonthestory.com, and you can order it through there, um, and you can just find out a little bit more about me. In fact. You can download the first chapter for free on, on my website as well, so that might be a, quite a good idea if 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 you if you're not sure, just download that first chapter and then you can have a read and you can get an, a rough idea that the the style of, of writing that I've got within this story because it's uh, it's it's said from the heart, you know. It's just uh, you know. I'm a working class guy. Uh, I left school with no qualifications and, and <laughs> I'm dyslexic. But you know, I've written a book, and so you'll see that that'll you'll, you'll see that it's just me coming through in that story. That it's it's the um you know it's not flowered up in any in any way. So, so it's um, easy uh, easy reading, a bit like mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I just I just think that you know just uh, whatever you do, you just got to just do it from the heart. Well, and just I, it from, from yeah, it, it's great to be able to read a book, literally read a book, and not have to keep a dictionary beside you. To look up yeah. the big words, so yeah, yeah. You There's know. a few big words in there, you know, but why not? Oh, okay. <laughs> but ultimately, no, yeah, but ultimately, it's every. I mean, if, if you see the reviews, they pretty much all say the same thing, which is not the same thing. But there's so many people who are actually saying that it's it, you once you start reading it, you can't put it down. It's one of those books, you know. It's a it's a page turner, and and that's other that's people true. saying that. That's not me just <laughs> just creating that notion. So you you will see. So so yeah. So. I think that's because it's. I just feel that with anything in life, if if it's authentic, and uh, then then it will just it'll find a life of its own, and then people will be attracted to it. You know, and that's yeah. with anything. You know, Fantastic. That's my, that's my, well, David, yeah. uh, we, we're pretty much come to the end of the show here. Uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming on and being our guest and telling your story. And uh, oh, we did yeah. mention where people can find your book, Shine On, on Amazon.com or on your website, uh, shineonthestory.com. So, uh, again, thank you uh, for sharing with us tonight. Uh, my pleasure. It's been great meeting you both and chatting. Yeah. Don't don't go away. Stay there, David. Okay. I will. All right. Well, All we right. want to... We want to thank everyone for tuning in to another edition of the Paranormal UK Radio Show, the flagship show here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And now, Irene, where can people find us? Everywhere, people. Just everywhere. Literally everywhere just these look, days. Just look, stick us in the search bar, and we're there. Yeah, where we are. Okay. Mm. All right. We will uh, catch everyone next week. Y'all have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. Bye.